Um, good evening, everybody. Simon says that I've got to say a little bit about myself and how I got interested in garden history, which is not what I was expecting. Um, I have to say that there are many routes to garden history, some people through geography, botany. In my case, it was through the history of art, which was my first career um, and uh, what I spent the first eight years of my working life doing. My speciality was the architecture and decorative arts of the 18th century. But as I went from my 20s into my 30s, the need to get a mortgage um, made itself imp increasingly felt, and I ended up in human resources, which was where my main career was. And it was really only after I took early retirement that I had the time and the space to once again pick up my interest in uh, fine arts. And from that, I became increasingly interested in um, garden history, and I completed my MA at the uh, Institute of Historical Research last year. So just to make you feel sorry for me, I was doing my archival research during the COVID pandemic. <laughs> um, the reason I've chosen Subric Park is that I think it's an absolutely fascinating house. Uh, architecturally, I think it's pretty well, well researched, but the gardens haven't been looked at at all. So the work that I did was original research. Um, today, I think it's probably best known as the clubhouse and the course of the Richmond Golf Course, but actually that obscures a more distinguished history. And my apologies for saying that if anybody's a member of the golf club. No, right, great. Um, and you can trace its history back to the early years of the 18th century. So I think, shall we start with a map? Let's see if I can get this to work. Yay. Oops, no. There we go. I really do love a good map. Um, I think it really helps to see where the house and the gardens that you're talking about are actually situated. And this is how we see it today. This I just simply downloaded from Google Maps. And the mansion of Subbrook Park is where that little uh, red spot is. And to the north, we've got the village of Petersham. And to the south, you've got Ham Common. To the uh, west, you bordering the park down there, you have that main road that runs from Richmond into Kingston, which is the 307. And on the right hand side over here, well, that's Richmond Park. So why is it called Subbrook? Well, Subbrook takes its name from a local stream called Southbrook, which flows down Richmond Hill, passing through Subbrook Park and the villages of Ham and Petersham before joining the River Thames at River, Le River Lane, which is just about there. Yep. Um, the earliest mention of Subbrook seems to be in the mid 13th century when it first appears as a hamlet of Petersham and it gets mentioned again in the mid 16th century in a lawsuit and then it pops up a third time in litigation dating from the early 17th century when the properties in question now include a house, 30 acres of land, meadows and pastures in Petersham. Now the Southbrook estate was formed of a combination of parcels of freehold and copyhold land. And although this map dates from the 1840s, it's as good as any to show how the estate was made up. If I can start perhaps by explaining how the color coding works, the pink, is freehold land. The yellow is copyhold land in the manner of Petersham, and the blue is copyhold land in the manner of Cadbury. The line that you can see down the middle is the borough boundary. So you've got about 90 acres just over in Richmond, and you've got approximately 44 in Kingston. Now, I'd love to be able to give you a totally comprehensive chronology of when every acre in this state was acquired, but I think you'd probably fall asleep. Um, so what I can do is to tell you that the first acres were acquired in 1712, when the Duke of Argyle purchased 20 acres in Petersham Fields, so we're looking somewhere there. In 1715, he added the manor house and grounds of Hatch Court, which was situated somewhere to the northwest of Ormley Lodge. Now, Ormley Lodge is here, 
So Hatch Court would have been round about there. Um, the Duke used it as a hunting lodge, but it burnt down almost as soon as he bought it, and it was never rebuilt. And I think that that event is what prompted the building of Subbrook House. In 1726, a further additional 32 la uh, acres were uh, enclosed from Richmond Park, which he leased from the Crown, which is this area here. Now, you may wonder, me having just said it was leased, why it's pink. Well, the reason for that is um, the Duke of Argyll's heir, his eldest daughter, Catherine Campbell, acquired the freehold of that area in the 1780s. Then, in 1730, the Duke enclosed, uh, included, uh, enclosed five acres from Ham Common for a cost of £200, and a year later, he gets another five acres from Richmond Park. So the first owners of the estate was John Campbell, second Duke of Argyll, and his second wife, Jane Warburton. Now, John Campbell was definitely the man of the moment in early Georgian England. He was the grandson of that wily woman, Elizabeth, Countess of, Di Countess of Diehart, Sart, sorry. And indeed, he was born at Ham House in 1680. An early entry into the army led to a distinguished career, first in the campaigns of Marlborough, and then later commanding in the English forces in Spain. He was active on the English side in the first Jacobite rebellion, defeating the Earl of Mar, and he was an influential, if behind the scenes figure, in the unification of England and Scotland, for which George I made him Duke of Greenwich, in addition to his existing title of Duke of Argyll. Now, we do have a contemporary description of him from a Lady Louise Stuart, who describes him in glowing terms. She said, he was having a personal beauty, an expressive countenance, a commanding air, and the most easy, engaging gracefulness of manner. Now, that may be so, but today we would have called him the most appalling misogynist. He really did have the most bizarre attitude to women, and he refused to let his daughters learn French because he said, wait for it, one language is more than enough for women to talk in. I mean, I could say more, truly I could. Um, the lady on the right is his second wife, Jane Warb Warbottom, and she was lady-in-waiting, or had been lady-in-waiting to Queen Anne, and then later Caroline when she was Princess of Wales. Now, despite her sort of aristocratic background, she was really a country girl. And if Lady Louise clearly liked the Duke, the, the same could not be said of what he, she felt about uh, his wife. And she describes Jane in the following terms as having a coarseness of language and manner, and not even the personal charms to compensate being considered ugly. Now, I mean, seriously, looking at that portrait, you can't help but say that is a little harsh. You know? um, Argyle had a very unsuccessful first marriage and separated early on, and it was this, during this period of separation that he met Jane and began an extended courtship, and they only married in 1717 after his first wife died. They had five daughters, uh, four survived in adulthood, but no son and heir. So moving on, right. Um, so that was the couple who were the first occupants of Sudbrook House. And the house was designed by a well-known Scottish architect, James Gibbs. Now, James was a Catholic, and he had initially trained as a priest in Rome. But the story goes he found life rather harsh as a trainee priest, and he gave it up for architecture. And it was during this time in Italy, and specifically in Rome, that he um, became acquainted with classical Palladian and Baroque architecture, which was to so influence his later style. Now, Sudbrook House was built between 1716 and 1719, which is generally earlier than a lot of books actually put the building of that um, house. Uh, but we know it was early, as early as that because of a letter from, our, um, from, the, from his banker which records payments to Gibbs for works on the house. And we also know that the work was reasonably advanced by 1716 because there is a letter 
um, dating from that year, saying that Gibbs was working at Sudbrook and that the Duke of Argyle proposed to spend most of the, his summer there. Now, the principal works appear to have been finished by 1719, and that's because that's the year that the last payments to Gibbs were made. So that's, this makes Sudbrook the earliest of all Gibbs works in Twickenham and well before the Octagon Room at Orleans House. Now, what we can see here is a plate from um, uh, Gibbs's book, The Book of Architecture, which was published in 1728. And it shows a corrected version of Sudbrook House. And I say it's a corrected version because the windows that are shown in this centre section of the engraving is not what was actually built at Sudbrook. Uh, these had been um, squared off and reduced, I think, to make the building look more Palladian than it actually was. It is very symmetrical. It's built round a central cube room there, which was accessed on both sides by these open porticos. And the cube room, as you can see up here, went through both stories of the building. And then on either side, you had these squarish wings, again, symmetrically arranged of five rooms each. Now, in terms, I mean, clearly, there's a very strong debt to, Pall to Palladio in that. Now, the Palladio Villa, which he's thought to most influence Subbrook House, is this one. Um, just to make it easy, <laughs> I've put a little square around it. And you can see that it's got the same cube room in the centre. And these are not rooms, they're deep open porticos. So exactly the same arrangement. And you've got, uh, got the same arrangement of symmetrically um, arranged rooms around the central core. Although in this case, there's six rooms rather than five. So I rest my case on that one. I think it's... Uh, it, it's pretty clear that, that that's the source of it. Um, so let's look at what the building looks like today. This is a picture I took of the north facade just a couple of weeks ago, and that um, is the main entrance into the building and was for most of the history of, of Subbrook House. The windows that you can see are the original ones that were designed by Gibbs. You can see they're more elongated with these rounded tops. And I think it makes it look much more like late Stuart architecture than it does classical architecture. Now, I don't know how much you can actually see, but this portico has been filled in. So it stands slightly proud of the main facade. Um, that was done to create an anteroom to the main salon, which is the, it's the cube room. And I think it was probably done for practical reasons, because otherwise I think it would have been incredibly cold. Uh, and today it's the bar of the clubhouse. Uh, there is some disagreement as to when that alteration took place. Um, there is an article from... Um, the country life, which is over 100 years old now, it was published in 1917, which suggests that that alteration was done as late as 1767. But not everybody agrees with that. And if we've got time, and, and, and if anybody's interested, after I finish my talk, I can explain why people think that it, it could be much earlier, indeed it is as early as the 1740s. So for comparison purposes, let's look at the unaltered facade, which was of equal importance, Oops. which is the south-facing facade. Uh, my apologies about the marquee. It doesn't really add anything to the architecture, does it? But I was very keen to show you this picture because I wanted you to see the relationship between this part of the garden and the house. Because although it's the putting green now, in the 18th century, it was the pleasure grounds. It was the ornamental part of the garden. And the rooms that you see either side of the portico um, are the principal rooms of, of, the, of the house. And you approach them through a flight of stairs. So, when, so basically, from those principal rooms, you would be looking down on the garden. And that's kind of, I think, quite important to remember when I show you how the garden develops. Uh, I've got another picture of that. Sorry, it's a black and white, and it dates from the, uh, seven, uh, from the 1930s. 
but um, I think you could, you've got a much better idea of what that portico would have been like. And uh, from my point of view, I think that architecturally, it is so much more successful than the front facade where it's been filled in. So, so much for the outside of the building and its Palladian qualities, but this building is not a purely Palladian building, and Gibbs was never a mainstream Palladian architect. There's really far too much Baroque in his work for him to be called that. But to understand Sabsbrook's Baroque credentials, you need to go inside, and in particular, you need to go into the cube room, which is the principal room of the, of the house. Again, this is a picture that I took a couple of weeks ago. It, uh, and this is, uh, these windows are the ones actually that look over the garden. And as you can see that the, uh, the walls are separated into panels, um, divided up by these bold, fluted Corinthian pilasters. Uh, the decoration is very Baroque. The doors are oak because it's fractionally too early for mahogany at this date. And I've got a detail to show you on that. Um, I think quite macho, I think, this, this decoration over the door. Obviously, the themes is the, you know, the weapons of war, which almost certainly is a reference to the uh, Duke's military campaigns. And the engraving that I've put on the left-hand side is a 17th century engraving of a type that we know Gibbs owned. And I think if you see the two together, you can see clearly where the influence for that design came from. If we move on and look over the alcoves, um, I, I think the, the, the quality of this, I think, is quite extraordinary, not to mention it is in... It's in a beautiful state of preservation. I mean, when I first saw this a couple of weeks ago, I, I thought, my goodness, it looks like William Kent. But of course, Kent actually wasn't influencing uh, Gibbs at this date. It was Roman Baroque interiors that were influencing both men. If we look at the other side of the room for a second, you can see the decoration is very much the same. You can also get a, a view of that incredible ceiling. But this side of the room is dominated by that sumptuous fireplace. It's made of marble, uh, above which there's a beveled mirror, and above that you've got the arms of the Duke of Argyle. And I've got a close-up there that you can see it. Unfortunately, you can see me taking the photograph at the same time. Um, now, read any general book on um, Petersham or, or Suffolk House, and you'll find it said that this fireplace may be by the Flemish sculptor Reisbrack. But actually, there's no real evidence for this at all. And if you consider that Reisbrack didn't arrive in England till 1720, and the house was completed in 1719, I think you, will, you are, you know, you're justified in thinking that it is somewhat unlikely. Now, a more likely candidate is actually the lesser known John Townsend, who we know was paid 700 pounds for masonry work at Sudbury. And he is also known to have had a connection with Gibbs and worked with him on other projects. In particular, he worked on the chancel decoration of St. Mary Le Strand. And if you're ever in that area, do pop in. It's a fabulous church. And uh, I'm sure that um, once you've looked at that area, you'll be able to see the strong similarities of Townsend's work uh, and this carving in Sunbrook. Um, I just want to quickly show you the ceiling, not that I've got much to say about it, but I think it's, uh, it is, as you see what I mean, very Baroque. There's nothing classical about that at all. So time, I think, to move on to the gardens. And the earliest map I could find, which include the house and gardens of Sudbrook, is the John Rock map, the environments of London, 1747. I think he's got a very, very busy style, so I'm just going to help us orientate on this. So obviously we've got, oops, sorry. Obviously, ooh, we've got the Thames here. This here is Ham House. Um, that is what today is the 307 and you access the park on Sudbrook Lane. So you came up here. There was um, a lodge just as you entered the park. So you came up this driveway. There's a rather impressive entrance with this glass, uh, grass plat. That's the mansion. And then you've got this funny U shape. 
This part of the U is a passageway that joined the main mansion to an annex that was built in the 1720s to house his daughters. He kept them out of the way because he said they made too much noise. Uh, and on the other side, that's a service area. So the bit in the middle is a bit like a muse. So I've got some pictures which show all those areas. That's the uh, lodge. Sorry again, it's black and white, but it looks exactly like that if you want to go and have a look. That is part of that passageway which joins the annex to the mansion. And that's the annex built in 1720. Uh, I think it looks quite institutional. It doesn't look sort of very homely for your daughters, does it? So you can see here um, how the passageway extends into that house. And over the years, um, it was enlarged and added, and extra rooms are added to it. So at the back here, you've got that, that service area. And that's what that area looks like today. OK, so let's talk a little bit more about the garden itself then. Back to this. Um, first of all, I just want to point out this square here. Now, in the 19th century, that was called the Dutch Garden. And thinking about its proximity to the house, its shape, and, and obviously this planting in there, I think that almost certainly was a parterre. This strange um, object here, now that's a mound. And I've got every reason to believe that that is an artificial mound, as opposed to the mound that you get in Richmond Park, which, as you know, is a, is a Bronze Age uh, burial chamber. It's decorated with seven avenues of trees, and there was enough surviving into the 19th century for us to know that those avenues were um, lime and um, <laughs> ash. Um, it is quite an old-fashioned feature at this date, I have to say. You more often associate them with the 17th century uh, and even earlier. But for some reason, they do survive in this area. There's quite a few of them. And you can see also the artificial mound there at the end of that long avenue belonging to Ham House. It's actually interesting to see, isn't it, how close Ham House is to Subbrook House. Now, to the rear of the building, you've got this area here, and that's called a wilderness. And a wilderness in the 17th century doesn't mean that it was a ne neglected piece of land. It has a very specific meaning. And it is an artificially planted woodland area, which forms part of a larger garden. And they can vary enormously in style. Uh, they were really areas for contemplation. You'd walk in them, perhaps you'd sit down and read. And I dare say, on the odd occasion, there was a certain amount of flirtation that went on there as well. It's not an area for flowers. It's definitely an area for trees. And if you look over here, that funny star shape, and we've got a, um, a more geometric one here, that one in particular is very similar to the wilderness that you get at Ham House. But I don't want to give the impression that I think the Duke is just copying his grandmother's garden. I think actually that is definitely not the case. Um, I think more likely uh, both gardens were influenced by a number of pattern books that were published um, during the late 17th century and early 18th century, of which this is one example. This is from The Theory and Practice of Gardening by John James, and it was published in London in 1715. And I think particularly those and those, you, you can see how close they are to the wilderness at Sudbrook. I wouldn't have, dis I know that this is published at the same time as the house was being built. Um, so I, I wouldn't say it was unduly old fashioned, but it's not cutting edge either, because these designs are highly derivative and strongly influenced by 17th century French designs. Let me just, if I can go back to the garden, sorry, just one time. Um, I just, before we leave this, I just want to say a couple more words about the, the, that, that wilderness. Um, because it's worth bearing in mind that um, Argyle's brother had uh, owned um, land in Witten uh, and had um, established a large collection of rare and exotic trees. So Argyle's choice of planting may well have been influenced by his brother, and indeed, who knows, he may have even sourced um, his trees from his brother's nursery. So... Um, 
When the Duke dies in 1743, um, Jane um, remains in the house until her own death. And something about what it was like to live at Subbrook at that time can be found in the diaries of one of their daughters, Mary Campbell. Now, uh, looking at this picture, on the spectrum of sense and sensibility, I think you can see from this portrait that she firmly falls into the latter camp. And she was quite a character. At the age of 19, she had an arranged marriage with uh, Edward Viscount Coked. Uh, it was not a success, and she was abandoned on her wedding night and then imprisoned at Holcomb Hall in Norfolk for the first two years of her marriage. A separation was arranged, and um, she was, uh, it was on the condition, really, that she lived at Subbrook with her mother and never came to London. But luckily, Lady, for Lady Mary, uh, his rock and roll lifestyle led to an early death in 1753, and she made up for lost time. She had a ball, she traveled in Europe and thoroughly enjoyed herself. She never remarried, although she developed an unrequited passion for the Duke of York. Um, he was the younger brother of George III, and she even claimed they had been secretly married, but it is sheer fantasy. You know, it definitely wasn't true. Improbably, Horace Walpole befriends her and dedicates his Gothic tale, The Castle of Otranto, to her. And now, it always seems to me to be a very unlikely friendship, but they were both addicted to society gossip, so that probably explains the basis of their friendship. Now, she does become increasingly odd, I should say eccentric even, as she gets older. She argues with her friends and um, she decides that the Empress Maria Theresa of Austria is plotting to have her assassinated. Anyway, she talks a lot about how cold Subrook House is and she talks a lot about her gardening activities, which she says soothes her mood. And she often talks about supervising the gardener, which I'm sure we could imagine he must have just about loved. She also talks about the livestock kept at Subbrook. Um, not surprisingly, there's things that you would expect, like oxen and cows and sheep and, and deer as well, because, you know, they are next door to, to Richmond Park after all. But what did come as a surprise to me in her diaries is that they also kept turkeys at um, Subbrook House. Now, after her mother's death, Mary moves out and Subbrook House becomes the main home of her elder sister and Argyle's heir, Lady Caroline Campbell. This was the only picture I'm afraid I could find of her. And she was Lady uh, Dal Cleath, and she got that title from her first marriage, but she was also Duchess of Greenwich, which she held in her own name. Now, this is the woman who buys the freehold of that leasehold land off the Crown in the 1780s uh, that had previously been part of Richmond Park. And she also extends, in a minor way, other areas of the state. She buys three fields to the north, which I'll show you in a moment. And it was also during her lifetime that Ormley Lodge, that's Ormley Lodge that we can see today, um, it comes into the Sudbrook estate. And that's really because it was owned by Lady Caroline's second husband, Charles uh, Townsend. And they were married in 1755, which gives us some kind of timeline for when that actually happened. Now, this was not a permanent arrangement, I have to say. And, the, and Ormley Lodge is never included in any of the sales of Subbrook House. Although she does pinch a bit of the back garden of, of, uh, and she does keep that. Now, of course, we are now in the second part of the 18th century um, at a time when we've got the English landscape movement in full flood. So I was fascinated to, uh, to learn how that movement was going to affect Subbrook House. And this is where I had a little bit of luck because the archivist at Bowden House told me about the existence of a survey dated from 1794, which had not shown up on any of the databases, you know, like Discovery at the National Archives. And this is it. Whoops, I've gone too far. This is it. And it dates from the time that obviously that, um, Caroline Campbell dies, and the estate is inherited by Henry Scott, who is also at that point the third Duke of the Clue. It's a real find. And looking at this, you can see that the English landscape movement didn't 
a touch it at all. And, you know, this is much more common than you might suppose in large houses of the late 18th century. If you look at this, um, really all you can see is a garden which has been allowed to deteriorate uh, and, and, and is clearly just neglected. Let's point, it, it's difficult to see, so I'm just going to point a few things out. These three fields up here are the additional um, fields that she bought, which I've just mentioned. Here, you've got, it's much more wooded, but these avenues here undoubtedly are the avenues that decorated that mound. So although you can't see it on this survey, it clearly is still there. The um, wilderness is absolutely unchanged. Nothing's happened there at all. Uh, and down here, well, we have got the addition of a nice kitchen garden. There's just one other thing I want to show you. I don't know if you can see it. Can you see that kind of sort of carbuncle on the side of the mansion? I don't know if you can see it. Can you? Just about there? Good, great. Um, that was an extension to the mansion and is still there now. And it, it is actually really an important discovery because there's always been some day, doubt about when that was built. But this survey shows categorically it was added in, in, in the 18th century and not the 19th century. So the estate only remains in the family of the, the, the Beaucaire family for 25 years. And in the 3rd of August, uh, 1819, the uh, estate went for public auction and only those three fields sold. So another attempt was made the following year. Uh, it's probably the better known of, of, of the auctions. And this one is dated, as you can see, the 30th of June, 1820. Now, the emphasis on the conditions and, uh, uh, and particulars of the sale was on the mansion, because to be fair, how could you say anything nice about that garden? So this is a quote from that document, and you can see it says ma magnificent Solon, you know, it says it's 30 foot, it goes on about the fluted plasters, the military trophies, and it says upstairs the six excellent bedrooms. And all it can muster about the gardens is this, a mansion is seated in, uh, in the centre of a beautifully wooded, wooded park, a kitchen garden artfully cropped and planted with fine standard um, wall fruit trees in full bearing. That is what I call damning with faint praise. Um, so um, actually there's a third sale one year after that, but still the, the estate doesn't sell. So the family are forced to rent out the estate, first to a Mr. Rakes, who was a banker, and then, in 1824, the tenancy was trans, uh, transferred to Robert Wilmot Horton, and within a year, he purchased the estate. So let me introduce Sir Robert Wilmot, uh, Sir, Sir, Sir William Robert Horton. Uh, he was a British politician who had a reasonably successful career in government, including being governor of Ceylon, as it was called. And in fact, for the six years between 1831 and 1837, he actually lived in Ceylon. Now, as an aside and as a bit of trivia, his wife, Anne Beatrix Horton, is said to be the lady to which Byron was referring when he wrote his poem, she walks in beauty like the night. Um, I read that on Wikipedia, so take it with a pinch of salt. Now, in 1825, he inherits the fortune from his father-in-law, which probably gave him the money to purchase Sudbrook House and another property at the newly built Richmond Terrace in Whitehall. That was to be his London house. Now, um, at this point, I just want to recap on a little bit of garden history and garden design again, and to explain the differences between 18th century uh, styles and early 19th, because unless we kind of touch base on that, it, you can't really appreciate what Horton did in his garden. So, as, as we've said, the 18th century, the late 18th century, um, nature dominates. It looks incredibly like nature, almost indistinguishable by nature, except that it's highly contrived. But in the early 19th century, the style was very different, and writers 
People like John Loudon believe that gardens should be indistinguished, should be distinguishable from nature and they should be works of art. So if I move on, and it was thought that plants, particularly the new introduction of exotic plants, should be seen to their best advantage if they were planted spaced out and in such a way as they could be seen in the round. Now, flower beds tended to be like you could see here. They were generally irregular. Sometimes they were round, but more often they were kidney shaped and they were linked together by winding paths. And this is an illustration from The Practical Gardener, which was published in 1828. And this style of gardening is called the Gardenesque. Now, if we compare what we've seen here with a detail from a survey of Sudbrook Park dated 1831, you can see what Horton has produced is a Gardenesque garden. So that wilderness is gone, and what you've got here to the rear of the house is you've got a double shrub border. In between, you've got, obviously, was a lawn in which you've got these island beds. To the um, left of the mansion, which if you remember rightly, the wilderness came right up to the walls, all that's been felled, and you've got another area of grass with these island beds, much fresher, far less um, claustrophobic, I think. Now, if we move out a section and have a look at the wilderness area um, proper, you can see that the geometric walks of the 1740s, and indeed right up to the end of the 18th century, now they've gone. Um, the woodland still absolutely dominates, but it's just, it, it looks more natural. The blue that you can see here, I think that is Southbrook, um, you know, the, the, the river that ran through the park. But what he's done here, which I think must have been lovely, he's put a riverside path that goes round the perimeter of the, uh, of, of, of the wilderness. And I think that must have been a, a very, very picturesque walk. So let's move out again and see the full survey. I mean, I think it's a thing of beauty all on its own, actually. So uh, you've still got features of the old garden there. See, you've got the avenues which indicate the mound is still there. They're clearly remnants from that. And down here, you've got this smashing uh, wall kitchen garden with the uh, five tenements and you've got the gardener's house there. And that bit there is the bit of garden that Caroline Campbell pinched from Ormley Lodge. This area here, I think, is, is simply to uh, protect the view from the house. I don't think it's a line of trees. I think it is a fence with hedging. Now, unlike the, uh, uh, the Argyles, uh, Horton doesn't use the whole estate for his own use. He only uses approximately 30 acres, which comprises of the mansion, the wilderness, and the um, kitchen garden. The rest, which is approximately 100 acres, is rented out there's a couple of minor leaseholders, but the main one is a man called Mr. Tubby. And Mr. Tubby is a cowkeeper from Ham. And I must, I must admit, I get very attached to Mr. Tubby and I watch his career with interest. And I thoroughly enjoyed reading his rent negotiations with the various owners of Subbrook Estate until he disappears from the records at the end of the 1850s. So, I've, um, my narrative has outpaced my notes, so you have to bear with me. Oops, sorry. Now, oh, I'm so sorry, I've got, got myself in a right mess here. Okay, now, um, Horton oh, clearly has spent a huge amount of money. You still hear me? Good. Uh, he's obviously spent a huge amount of money on his house, but he doesn't really live in it very long. Um, he only owned it for six years before he went off Salon, and immediately he returned to England, he attempts to sell the estate. And it really is a puzzle why this should be. Documents held in the family papers in Derbyshire and papers held at the National Archives indicate he had money problems. There was mortgages taken out using Subbrook as surety. And on one occasion, there's even um, details of a loan that is... Um, 
where he's used his wife's jewellery as, as surety. So I really don't know kind of what happened there. Anyway, this is um, a detail from the particular in conditions of sale of the first of those sales, dated the 3rd of August, uh, 1831. And as you might suppose, a great deal is made about the improvements that have been made. And um, I'll read this. It says, a picturesque beauty rarely to be found. The flower garden is tastefully laid out to lawn, walks and parterres with the most choice flowers and shrubs. The pleasure grounds and wilderness occupy several acres and are clothed with a profusion of shrubs, evergreens and forest trees. And then it goes on. The land, sorry, that should be is, not as, is of a very superior quality and ornamented by stately elms, limes and oaks. And then the next sentence is really significant when you consider what happens next. He then, go, then goes on to say, the whole estate being so beautifully timbered, affords desirable sites for the erection of detached villas. Now, despite that heavy sell, uh, it doesn't sell. And in 1837, the Department of Works visits and surveys the estate with a view to purchase it on behalf of the Crown. And this brought me to another very lucky find in the National Archives. Honestly, as a researcher, you dream about finding things like this. Now, this is a notebook with sketches and comments that was written um, during that initial visit. And you can see there the date, February 1837. Um, below the uh, sketch of the house, you've just got general comments about house is made up and its general condition. But from my point of view, the really interesting one is here. And I think you can see what it says. It says, the garden wall badly wants repairing. And then down here says, the garden in bad plight. Uh, all the ground wants fresh digging and planting. And my goodness, the apple trees turn up again. There are some good apple trees in the garden. Um, so, Anyway, the, the Ministry of Works recommend purchase. And um, the report goes to the Treasury and they're having none of it. And they say this, they say that it is ineffective to make an unprofitable purchase for the Crown. So actually nothing happens at all. The next thing I want to show you is this. Now, this is an engraving of Sudbrook Park, uh, and it's from the art collection of uh, Orleans House, and it's dated 1840. I've got my doubts about that date, I have to say. You can see that's the garden facade. Uh, there you've got, um, you know, the ladies' house, that annex, and that's the addition that Caroline Campbell put on, you know, which was in that survey. Um, if it really is the 1840s, then I think it's being um, a bit, uh, well, I don't think it's all as it seems, shall we say. Um, Horton dies in 1841, and at that point, contact is um, made with the Ministry of Works, this time via his widow and agent. And a new survey is prepared in July 1841. Oops. And that is the front page from it. Um, and what it talks about is sort of you know, neglect and deterioration, basically. And the reason for that soon becomes clear. With no sale in sight, the Hortons took the decision, like the Cunards did 60 years later at Marble Hill, to develop their parkland for housing. And the 1841 report mentions a proposal to build villas on a very extended scale that is tantamount to a little new town. Now, originally there was a lithograph that accompanied this report. And um, although that hasn't survived, if you read the full report, it's absolutely clear that the Hortons planned to build 123 houses and that indeed preliminary work was already underway. There had been wide fells, uh, widespread felling of trees, 52 elms in the south of the park and 60 oaks from the area that bordered Richmond Park. But more importantly, the 1841 survey mentions the existence of a brickyard. 
to supply bricks needed for the building work. And at the time of the visit, 12,000 bricks were found burning and 70,000 were found um, drying. And you can see where it's referred to in here. Now, the sheer scale of the operation be, can be seen in the Knox, next document, which is an account of the expenses of work of Sudbrook Park. And here you can see the date, it's 1840-1841. And it says, for the making of one million and fifty bricks already burnt and ready for use, £25 shilling per thousand. And then it goes on, for the grubbing up of old tree, and I think that says stools of underwood, digging brick earth, which is obviously clay, and cleaning same roots and stones. Um, and then it goes on, altogether sufficient for another 497,000 bricks. Just extraordinary, I think. Um, now, despite this, or really because of this, the surveyor concluded that there was a greater profitability in buying the estate than there had been in 1837, but only as a, a building project. And although it was suggested that 32 acres of the parkland that had been originally taken from Richmond Park should be absorbed back in the, in the park. And this time, the Treasury agreed to the sale. Now, over the next two years, there was a certain amount of dithering and delay, and the Department of Works did indeed uh, reabsorb that land back into Richmond Park, but nothing came of the building project, and the estate remained unlet for 1844, which is the date of the next map. So the improvements that we can see here could have been done by the new tenants, or they could have been done by the Ministry of Works to prepare the estate for Redkill. And the thing I really want to point out from here is the existence of this new kitchen garden in the wilderness. Uh, but what really interests us, I think, is the mansion and the pleasure grounds. And this is a close up of that survey. You can see there's been a certain amount of improvements to the infrastructure. The, there's a road here, uh, the front is still the main entrance. But what they've done now is put a road around the back so you could enter the house from the back as well. That um, gardener's garden has gone. What's happened is that you've got formality back in the garden. And when I saw this and these narrow rectangular beds laid out in that formal way, there was one thing I thought of and one thing only, and that was carpet bedding. So we'll have a quick look at carpet bedding. I downloaded this from the internet. This is from Eastbourne Seafront, and a very good example, I think, of the sort of things that you would have seen in that garden. Now, um, the new tenants took over in uh, 1844, and they were a Dr. Weiss and his assistant, a Dr. Ellis. That is Dr. Ellis, okay? Um, and it was these two men who opened a hydrotherapy establishment in 1844. Now, hydrotherapy was a Victorian health fad. It had originated in Germany, and it rested on the therapeutic use of hot and cold water and being wrapped up in wet towels. Um, it, was a it was supposed to cure everything from fainting fits, diarrhea, nervous fits, toothache, and even measles. And it was hugely popular during the 19th century. And Sudbrook, being a very elegant mansion and uh, with its proximity to London, it became a very fashionable and popular venue. And Darwin and Tennyson are believed to have been patients at Sudbrook. Um, there is a splendidly um, titled book called A Companion to the Watering and Bathing Place of England. It, it just goes on and on for, for, for hours, this title. I'm not... I'm running out of time, so I won't give it to you in full. Um, but this is a really useful book because it tells you what it was like to stay at Southbrook House during that period. And to me, it seems it was a bit like a health farm. Um, we know that there were three categories of patients, uh, all paying very different amounts, although the book made it absolutely clear that the quality of the uh, medical intervention was the same for everybody. Uh, we know the gentleman lived in the annex, um, we know that the patients were encouraged to take healthy walks in Richmond Park or wander in the grounds or wander down by the river. And they were encouraged to eat together in the evenings in the cube room. But it also says you don't have to if you don't want to. 
Um, ten years later, uh, we get a Mrs. Thompson writing this about Sudbrook. I think she's a bit like a 19th century trip advisor. And she says, my imagination still brightens when I recall the green lawns, the cedars, the oriental plains, the tulip trees and magnolias of Sudbrook. But not everybody was as happy with Sudbrook as Mrs. Thompson, because uh, I found this. Um, unfortunately, it is undated and it, it's anonymous, but I'm going to read this in full because believe me, it's worth it. It says, a hydropathic uh, establishment called Subbrook Park, conducted by the villain Mr Ellis, uh, is a, a place of the most dangerous kind for any person to send their friends or daughters to. Um, from the, uh, villa, the vilely immoral character of the proprietor, who has supported his position for some time past by his cloak of hypocritical piety, as well as by his assumed character of a medical man. But a quack is not, a quali is not qualified. And indeed, he wasn't qualified. He was originally a lace merchant from Twickenham. Um, and it said, um, and from his uh, well-known immoral character is unfit to conduct an establishment where so many in a helpless state of health are being constantly placed in his power. And it goes on. The gates of this place should surely be closed if persons will but be persuaded of the delusion they have been labouring under while they have been so frequently attracted to a place which, although picturesque and beautiful in itself, has been for a length of time conducted by a dangerous and immoral villain who has but sought through his snares and villainy to ruin more than one innocent woman. Well, you say, what on earth has been going on? Has there been impropriety in the shrubbery? That's what you want to know. But um, this isn't the only time that Mr Ellis actually courts controversy because in 1846, he found himself um, uh, in court being charged with manslaughter due to medical neglect. Uh, one of his patients um, had died. Now, he does get acquitted, uh, uh, but the, the man in question, who was called Richard Dresser, he was a personal friend of, of Mr Ellis and was in um, a state of advanced liver disease. Uh, so I think that Ellis probably did uh, deserve to be acquitted. It affected his reputation, but he recovered, and indeed the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the establishment recovered too. And it doesn't close until... Sorry? Um, I've lost my... Uh, it doesn't close until 1879. At which point, the uh, lease of the house and the land was granted to the Marquis of Butte. Um, he had other properties in the area, and generally the uh, subbrook was sublet. Now, at this stage, I have to say, my research of Subbrook Park effectively stopped, and the Ministry of Work files for this period went missing in the National Archives, so I really couldn't do any more research. So I've only got snippets of information to go on. The OS maps show no dramatic alterations to the mansion or landscape. And so all I can say is two bits, two facts that I know, is that in 1886, the house is said to have been a private hotel. Now, if anybody can point me in the direction of primary sources which supports that, I would be really, really pleased to know. Um, and then in um, the, uh, the 5th of April in um, 1898, the lease that was held by the Marquis of Butte expires and a new 21-year lease for 107 acres was offered to the Richmond Golf Club, and they took it up. Virtually the entire estate did indeed go to the um, golf club. There was two and a half acres held back, and then there was a clause in the lease that um, there was a further eight acres where, if in the future, the Ministry of Works wanted to build housing, they could. And in uh, 1931, they did. And this area here, which as you can see is the old guard, the kitchen garden, is now Subbrook Gardens. And that's me, and I'm sorry, I've gone over by 10 minutes. I shall never be asked again. Any questions? Or are you stunned into silence? <laughs>
questions, please? Comments? Hello, um, an excellent talk. Um, I think the Crown Estate must have bought it at some stage because Richmond Golf Club bought it off the Crown, Crown Estate about six years ago. It was the freehold that they bought. Ah. Yeah, because this, this was leased. Yeah. Could you explain what copyhold is? Copyhold, oh goodness me, it's, it's a, bit, a bit like leasehold, but it's more medieval. Um, you know, you had land, that all, all the land was either from the Crown or, or, or from the, um, uh, or, or, you know, manners. And then there was a series, uh, property law is not my specialist subject, I have to say, but as I understand it, there was a series of laws in the mid 19th century, and I think the important one was 1853, which allowed for the refranchisement, if I've got the, of copyhold land. And in, in fact, the Ministry of Works re-enfranchises the Subbrook estate at that time, or it took them 10 years to do it. Did Horace Walpole uh, visit at all? Um, uh, he does write about it. Uh, in, he, he talks about the, the, the Slivian delights, I think, you know. So, um, you know, he lived quite close by. I would be really surprised if he didn't. Is he obviously open? knew it, you know, oh, yeah. because he yeah. describes the gardens. Is it ever open that you can see all um, the gardens? Well, I found, them, uh, I found them really nice, actually. I went along there and, uh, you know, I said, can I take pictures, please? And they were very easygoing. And I understand that um, they take guest players too. You don't actually have to be a member. Right. There's a certain decayed grandeur about it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Great talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Why? It, it was put on the market several times and failed to sell. Why? Oh, oh. Because it looks... Well, if you ask me that in a year's time, I might be able to tell you because there are some letters up in Derbyshire uh, which deal with the, um, the failure to sell Sudbrook. And I, I want to read those because that might give me some insight. I don't know, is the simple answer to that, because it looks absolutely fabulous. It does, most beguiling. Yeah. Is it still obvious where the mound was? Ah, I'm so glad you asked me that. I was really hoping somebody was going to ask me that. Well, I think it is. As I was driving through the park two weeks ago, I saw a sort of raised area, which was, I think it was near the, the 12th hole or something. Uh, and it, it was not exactly the place that that mound should have been. And I can't, I just... It's just too much of a coincidence. I just wonder whether it was. As far as I know, there's been no archeological survey done of the golf course, so we can't know for sure. But it was massive, wasn't it? You could see how big it was. Anyway. Do we know why the second duke wanted to build a house in Sudbrook? Was it to be near court? Um, or was I, it a I hunting think, lodge? Or? Um, I think that feeds into the whole uh, subject about the charm of Twickenhamshire in the 18th century. You know, it was an area which had been slowly gentrifying from the late 17th century. And I think there's a lot to do with its proximity to Hampton Court and to Richmond. And uh, it, it just becomes a really fashionable area. You know, you get, well, you get Walpole, you've got Pope there, and it, it has, and you have a lot of dowager duchesses sort of, you know, retiring there. Um, I suppose, I, I don't know, what, what would be an equivalent now? Um, I don't know, cert certain parts of the Cotswolds maybe. <laughs> I have to confess, we are members of the golf club. Oh, are you? I'm so sorry. <laughs> well, I've but said nice things too. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that if some members of the Historical Society wanted to come for lunch or something someday, it could be arranged. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That, that's lovely to know. Maybe we can organise a visit when it's 
clock's getting warmer again. I've got one question from Hugh um, on Zoom, which is, what is the purpose of the mound? Um, I think, uh, it, in this context, I think it's a vantage point from which to see this very picturesque area of the river. Any, any further questions or comments? Right. If not, you'll know that we give, we'd like to give our speakers a little something. Oh, thank you very much. Oh. Thank yep. you. <laughs> right.